If you got your Bible, I don't know what to do about that. If you got your Bible, turn with me to Ephesians chapter number two. Ephesians chapter number two, and I and I want to clarify um, tonight, um, not necessarily about Joel Osteen. I, I'll I'll clarify it another time. Um, but I don't dislike uh, what they call canned music. Anybody don't know what I'm what what she means when we say canned music? Canned music is what hyper fundamentalists labeled music that was on a tape because it was canned. Like I've heard preachers preach against it, um, which is stupid. Um, there's nothing wrong with with canned music. What I am a fan of is the church singing. Um, and we'll talk about this in, in days ahead as well. Um, but the sound of the church should be the sound of the congregation. I'm thankful for Miss Beverly. I, I, I've said it often. I love Miss Juanita and the organ. Um, I love guitars. I love banjos, you know, Brother Gene. Um, I don't mind keyboard, drum. I mean, we can have a full orchestra. If you can play an oboe, we'll put, an, we'll put you a chair up here and you can play the oboe. I don't even know what an oboe is, but you can play that oboe. Um, I'm, I'm for those things. Um, th there's nothing wrong. Um, I, I love special music. I asked Miss Gloria to sing this morning. I love special music. I love choir music. Um, I grew up singing in the choir. Jeff, uh, Jeff will tell me, you know, he, he says that he remembers um, singing in a choir. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the choir. I, I love, well, I don't really want to say that I love quartets, but I can appreciate the purpose of quartets. Um, there's nothing wrong with those things. There's nothing wrong with the praise team. There's nothing inherently wrong with what they call a praise team. But every single one of those things will never replace the congregation. The sound of the church should be the sound of the congregation. And so um, the, the church this morning, the last couple of weeks, um, has been singing out and it's been, it's been beautiful. <laughs> Ephesians 2 um, I want to. Uh, I, I wanted to start this last week, but that didn't work out. Um, beginning in this new year, I want us to slow down a little bit on Sunday nights. Um, sometimes I talk so fast and say so much that neither you nor I have any idea what I just said. Somebody say, "Amen." Um, Jerry came to me tonight. He said, was Samaria in the, in, in the northern kingdom or the southern kingdom? I said, I don't know, Jerry. I had to go look at my notes. What did I say? And he was just, he was just picking at me. But a lot of times in church, we're, we don't take the time to really explain things. I was talking to Wayne about an issue, um, and we were just having a normal conversation. And he made a statement. He said, you know, I've been in all, I, he said, I've been in church most of my life. He said, I've never thought about that like that. Um, when we got done with uh, communion, the first time we did communion here, um, you know, I had somebody come to me with tears and say, you know, I've never seen it like that. And I think there's a danger in assuming that we know more than we know. There's a dangerous assumption in pastors and preachers um, There's a dangerous assumption in pastors 
that they assume that people know more than they may know. They're the things that I know, somebody had to teach me. I had good pastor, I had good Sunday school teachers, I've read good books. And all too many times, pastors spend so much time in libraries that they come out sounding uh, like librarians. They sound dusty and moldy, and there's just a danger in that. So over the course of uh, the next several weeks or months or until I get tired of it or you get tired of it, one, I want us to slow down and, and deal with uh, defining some terms, what we could call basic Christianity, biblical Christianity, just, just kind of back to the basics. And tonight, I want to look at the subject of the church. Uh, Ephesians 2, 11 through 20. Take that off, James. Ephesians 2, 11 through 20. Beginning of verse number 11, the Bible says, Therefore, remember that at one time you, uh, at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once were afar off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both us one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father." So then you were no longer strangers and aliens, but you were fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God, by the Spirit. Tonight I want to talk about the church. The church. We use that phrase a lot. We've got it on the sign. And we are to, we are to clarify what we mean and what we're talking about and what its purpose is and kind of just hash it out for a minute. The church is a people. The church is not a building. We do have a beautiful church building, but it's just a building where the church assembles. Church in the New Testament is the word ecclesia. Ecclesia comes from two Greek words, which means those that have been called out. And they have been called out to assemble. So it speaks of the called out ones who assemble. That's what that word ecclesia or church is. The church is a group of people who have been born again that meet together to worship God. Let's not confuse the church building with the church itself. There are, a number, there are a number of things that we could say about the church, but I just kind of want to hit some basics tonight and answer maybe some ideas and some questions. 
what is the church? I gave you a, a definition, the ones who have been called out to assemble, but what is the church? When you read the book of Acts, you find that the early Christians, they didn't have buildings like we have now. I think about the 40 years or so that Brother Gene served on the property committee walking around these grounds and making sure that the lights were still on and the bulbs still worked, making sure that hinges were right. Thank God for the maintenance on the building. But the early church didn't have buildings like what we have now. The early church suffered great persecution. They were killed for being Christian. And so they would gather together in people's homes. They would all get together over at Gloria's house and they'd sing and they'd preach. Well, then they'd all get together over at the abbot's house and they would sing and they would preach. They would gather together like that. This was first century Christianity. This is uh, what they knew. However, as the influence of Christianity spread, eventually buildings were built. Some of them became very nice. You can look through history at some of the older architect over in, um, over in places like England and even in places in America. That older architect was beautiful. But those buildings, those buildings were never the church. The church is the group of people that have been saved by God's grace that gather together to worship God. This is what the church is. Church buildings, church structure, structures simply facilitate the meeting. And they're just serving a purpose. Y'all, this is important. Because some of y'all are sitting on pews that your grandma sat on, or your, maybe not that old, but, but your, your papa sat on, or your dad sat on. And in churches, we have a bad tendency to worship the building. You ever... You ever, I've seen fights. I'm talking about fights break out. Because somebody's pawpaw bought that pew and had their name on the end of that pew on that little placard. And that was their pew. And you better not sit in their pew. Listen to me. There's a dangerous tendency to fall in love with the building itself. Um, I know we've got this this remodel project coming up, and there'll be colors, and and eventually we're going to have a conversation about carpet, and and if we're not careful, we'll get so caught up in those things that we forget that those things don't necessarily matter. It don't matter what color the carpet is. I mean, I don't want it hot pink, say amen. But it don't matter. It don't matter. It doesn't matter. The church is the group of people. And whenever you care more about things than you do the people sitting on those things, then you're messed up. The church is a group of people. It's not the building. It's not the bricks. The church is the body of Christ. When talking about the church, there, there are two ideas. There is what they call the visible, local church. And then there is this idea of the universal church. Who knows what a... Who knows what a creed is, the Apostles' Creed? You know what the creed is. There's a phrase in there. We believe in God the Father. 
We believe in God the Son. We believe in God the Holy Spirit. And we believe in the Holy Catholic Church. A little c, Catholic, in the Apostles' Creed. That word Catholic is a word that was used to mean universal. They were not talking about the Roman Catholic Church when they wrote that. They were talking about we believe in the universal Church. Church And this idea of the universal church is the idea that every single person that has been truly born again is part of the body of Christ. It amazes me, um, Slim's not here tonight, I took him to Tennessee around a bunch of people that didn't know him. They didn't know the good, the bad, the ugly. They didn't know they didn't know Slim, all right? And them people loved him. And he couldn't get over it. But listen to me, that is normal for the body of Christ. What is it that can take a man from here and send him even over to California where they hate everybody? And find another group of people that have been truly born again and there's genuine love. Jesus said, this is how all men will know that you're my disciples. Because you love the brethren. Because you love one another. This idea of the universal church is the idea that every single person who is truly born again, whether they're a Baptist, whether they're a Methodist, whether they're a Pentecostal, whether they're Church of God, whether they're Church of Christ, or if somehow in the world Joel's group come. No matter who they are, if they have truly been born again, they are part of the universal church. However, most of what you see in scripture, I would dare say more than 90% of scripture, when, uh, when, when, when you see the word church, it wasn't written to necessarily the universal church, but rather it was written to a local, visible body of believers. This universal church is what they call the invisible church. Can't really see it. And you can see parts and pieces of it, Brother Gene, but you can't really see it. However, the local, visible body of believers that meet regularly, that is the church. From the Browers in the back to Miss Beverly in the front. We are a local body of believers. Now, we need to be careful not to confuse some things about the two. The universal Invisible church is pure, is holy. But the local body of believers, that visible group, can get messed up. Uh, The perfect example is there are times, and there may be times now, where somebody can be lost and be a member of a local church. They shouldn't be. Sure, they shouldn't be. But we go on professions of faith. We go on baptisms. We go on letters. It's complicated. We can look at a man's fruit, but we can't judge his soul. And so the local visible at times may look a little bit messy. But God knows whose are his. You have the local, 
and you have the visible. Well, that's what the church is. It's real deep, ain't it? It's real, that's real profound. We need to, we need to understand this, all right? I don't agree with everything that our friends down at the Church of God believe. I make no apologies about that. I'm a Baptist. Amen. I'm, I'm, that, I'm comfortable with who I am. There are some disagreements, but listen to me. There are those in there that are part of the church. They're brothers and sisters in Christ. There's folks at the Methodist Church. There's folks that go to Anadarko. I know it bothers me too. But I believe Chase Brower's a brother, even though I give him a hard time. We need to understand. We need to understand what the church is. Well, <coughs> not just what is the church, but what does the church do? What does the church do? If the church is not a building, but a body of believers. By the way, buildings don't do nothing but stand there. I mean, that's, that's, that's it. So what does the church, what does the body actually do? What is its nature? What is its purpose? What is its biblical roles or ministry? There's three basic ones, and I know the church, the church does a lot but there's three basic things that the church does biblically the first one is worship the second one is edification and I'll explain what that means in a minute edification and the third one is evangelism if you boil it all down to what the church does it revolves around those three things. Worship. Worship is God-centered and Christ-centered. It's not about entertaining. It's not about putting on a show. It's not about you uh, singing your favorite song or that preacher dealing with your favorite text. Worship is not about you. Worship is about God. The church, the people, the body come together to worship God. And we'll deal with this in the weeks ahead when we talk about music. But that's why our music, our singing, should not be me-centered. But rather they should be God-centered. Do you know... Why I love hymns, or let me let me first blow everybody's mind. I love hymns. Hymns are my favorite. Not a big fan of of a whole lot else. There's some stuff I like listening to going down the road, brother Gene. But when we come together as a body, I love hymns. You know why? Because they have substance. Because they're saying something. Because they have some meat to them that are completely derived out of Scripture. Most of the modern contemporary songs, you could replace Jesus with Bailey and you would think that somebody had wrote a love song toward Bailey. Oh, Bailey, I love you. Bailey, 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 I love you, Bailey. Bailey, we all love you. Bailey, we showed up to see you. Bailey, we love you. That doesn't compare to amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now, I, now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. All of that is pulled out of Scripture. Every line of it is pulled out of Scripture and pushes our hearts and minds toward God. Not just singing, but preaching is a part of worship. Preaching, 
The point of preaching is not to bring a bunch of people together so that I can send you home feeling better. The point of preaching is not to come in here and talk to you for 45 minutes so that y'all can all leave and go down there to Brahms and talk about what a good preacher y'all got. The point of preaching is to take the Bible, explain it, and point you to Jesus. Or, Or even simpler than that, the point of preaching is God centered, it is to lift up. His name. It's not about you feeling better. It's not about you finding earthly success. It's about His Son. Worship. Our prayer. Our giving. All of that is a part of worship. We don't sing so that you can see our talent. The preacher doesn't preach or he shouldn't preach so that you could see his talent. You don't give so that everybody can pat you on the back and talk about what a good giver you are. You don't do none of that. It's not about you. Do you know why the majority of churches have problems and end up splitting? Because some individual didn't get their way. You boil it all down. Churches usually don't split over major doctrines, the deity of Christ, the virgin birth. No, they usually split over which side the piano is going to go on. Miss Beverly, if you're watching this, Miss Juanita, if you're watching this, it don't matter which side of the room it's on. We'll put them both up on the stage so there's no arguing. Those things don't matter. Church is not about a pastor. Don't miss this. I love y'all. And I love that y'all love me. And I love that y'all take care of me. But if you come to church and you simply see me, you've missed it. You've missed it. I have failed miserably. Because it's not about me. You know why preachers get their feelings hurt and get upset? I'm not talking about all the time. God moves people and, and sometimes people are really dumb. But do you know why preachers get upset and quit and go home pouting? Because they forget that ministry isn't about them. Well, what does the church do? We come together to worship. I understand Listen to me. I understand that as a Christian, it is your responsibility to live a lifestyle of worship. But I'm talking about what the church does. We come together to worship. The church not only has a purpose of worship, but it has a purpose of edification. Or to edify one another. To build up one another. Another. How do we do that? We hold each other accountable. We encourage. We help our fellow believers mature in Christ. We help them, we help them get from milk to meat. I've had some rough conversations since I've been here. I was talking with a fella from from South Carolina um, and I talked about him, I talked to him about the difference in between uh, pastoring in the Bible Belt and pastoring out here. I said, all of them fights that, that we fought in the Bible Belt, these folks ain't fighting. Thank God y'all ain't fighting them fights. I mean, it's it's a blessing. They spend all them time fighting those fights and shooting themselves. They, they, they're really not building up anything. It, listen, you, Jesus cuts you. The word of God will cut you. But it will also give you a band-aid. 
And I've had some rough conversations since I've been here. And y'all have loved me for it. I've had men that I told that, um, I told them that they were sorry. This isn't from the pool. It's easy to say that stuff from the pulpit, Brother Gene. Because it's easy to hide behind a pulpit. But I've said that in counseling. And they love me for it. I'm not doing that to be a jerk. Bailey and, and Chase were over at the house the other night. I was talking about my abrasive nature. Y'all have figured that out by now. Um, I don't do it just because I wake up in the morning and say, how can I be like Melissa Abbott today? And then sit around all day and think of ways to do that. No. I know that if you're about to step on a snake and that snake's going to hurt you, then somebody needs to tell you about that snake. If you choose to step on the snake anyway, that makes you stupid. But it makes me loving for telling you to, that is the purpose of the church. It's not the purpose of the preacher. Men and women ought to be able to look at one another, holding each other accountable to the word of God, not your traditions or your own personal standards or your own opinions, but to the word of God. The pastor ought not be the only one that's out hunting all the people that have been laying out for weeks and months at a time. It is the church's responsibility to edify, to build up, to encourage. And we do that through many ways. We do that through Sunday school, through Bible study, through all these, the VBS, all the things that we do. Those are tools to help build you up. To encourage you. Because you can't do it alone. Edification. So the church's purpose is worship. The church's purpose is edification. But the church also has a third purpose. Evangelism. Evangelism. This means, very simply... Taking what we have out to people who do not have it. Preacher, I, I just get so discouraged. We go Sunday after Sunday and we don't ever see anybody give their life to Christ during the service. That discourages me too at times. But we don't gather together simply for that purpose. There is an evangelistic element, but that's not the main element. The message that we have, the gospel, is to be taken somewhere. Not to sit around and look at and just wait on other people to look at. That reminds me of a story. There was a fella out of North Carolina. He walked outside a Cracker Barrel. And he just, y'all know what a Cracker Barrel is, don't you? Hallelujah for Cracker Barrels. And he just stood up looking at the sky. Well, for too long, a couple of other folks come by and start looking at him and looking up. And, what are you looking at? And he said, he's a coming. Well, they kind of stood there, kind of two or three more people, and was, they thought the guy was crazy. So what are you looking at? He said, he's a coming. Who's coming? Jesus is coming back. Well, hallelujah. That's wonderful. He was taking that message to them. What we do is we come around church, and we all stand around and look up. He's a coming. He's a coming. He's a coming. Yes, he is a coming. But while he's coming, he has given us express orders to take this message to our neighbors to not, to not, do you remember when Jesus ascended into the sky? They was getting ready to start the first Baptist church of the upper lookers. He said, 
Why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus that went will come again. Go to Jerusalem. Tarry there until you receive power. After that which the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And you shall be witnesses. A church that is not reaching out is a church that is failing miserably. Well, preacher, I have been talking about this for a long time. We need to, we need to organize a visitation night and go and knock some doors. Listen to me. With all due respect, we don't need to organize. You need to go do. Go do. More people come to Christ through friends, family, and acquaintances than do from somebody knocking on a door. I'm for door knocking, all right? Go knock them all. But if you're not willing to talk to your family about it, why would you be willing to talk to a stranger? The church has a purpose of evangelism. We do many things. We do many things that really don't matter. Let's be honest. I, I, I was asking Wayne in that conversation. I said, we really ought to think. Think. What are we doing? And why are we doing it? On everything. On everything. What are we doing? Why do we do it this way? Is this the way? The, does God have something to say about the matter? Why, why, do we, why do we sing three songs? Why do we take up the offering in the middle of those songs? Why do we do it? What are we actually doing? Why are we doing it? And does it glorify God? Listen to me. A lot of nonsense, a lot of bickering, fighting, and complaining would be cut out if we simply ask the questions, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? And does it glorify God? And if it doesn't glorify God, go do something else that does. And I know right now, half of y'all thinking, well, surely he ain't talking about this. And surely he ain't talking about that. I'm talking about all of it. These are questions during COVID that I had to ask myself about preaching. Why do I preach the way I preach? Does the Bible have something to say about it? Does it glorify God? I've had to ask myself these questions about singing. What am I listening to? I had to ask myself this stuff about my family. There's some hard questions, y'all. This is the purpose of the church, to glorify God. And all too many times we're letting uh, things that don't mean Nothing. When, when it's more important to make a meeting of a, of a particular committee than it is to make a church service, your priorities are wrong. When it's more important Help us, Lord. We're going to get in trouble. When being seen is more important than serving, then something is wrong. Something is wrong. What does the church do? The church worships, edifies, evangelizes, all to glorify God. Do you remember... Uh, I believe it's over in 1 Timothy, um, maybe chapter number 3, I believe it is. The end of chapter number 2, end of chapter number 3. 
where Paul is, is saying that I'm writing these things so that you'll know how to beha behave yourself in the house of God. And he goes on to talk about the bride, the church being the bride of Christ. Now imagine, imagine that um, I had to go away for a little while and I left my bride with you. And it was your responsibility to look out for her watch out for her, to keep her pure. Uh, I believe First Timothy, the way he says it is pure and chaste as a virgin. It's your job to keep her undefiled and clean. But instead, you hiked up her skirt because you thought maybe that would draw more people. You lowered her, you lowered her top so that you could draw more people. You did all of these things to flash her up so that she could catch the eyes of more people and maybe draw more people. Well, what have you, what have you done? You've prostituted the bride. You've made a mockery of the bride. And, and how do you think it's going to work out when the husband gets back? He's going to be mad. I know we talk about Judgment Day and we talk about those who do evil. It's not so much the pimps, the prostitutes, the drug dealers, the drunkards, the homosexuals. I mean, they have something to fear on Judgment Day. But there are a lot, a lot of pastors that have pimped the bride of Christ that are going to have something to answer for. Our job as a church is is to glorify God. In the Bible, God uses several images of the church. He uses the body, he uses the people of God, and he uses the bride of Christ. And he uses more. He uses a foundation, a building. Uh, but Christ is the head of the church, Ephesians 1.10 and 4.15. And Christians are the body. We are to do well to take note of that. He is the head. We are the body. He uses the people of God as another image of the church. God says of the church, I will be their God, and they will be my people. 2 Corinthians 6, 18, Hebrews 8, 10. The church is also referred to as the bride of Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, 2, Ephesians 5, 32, Revelation 19, 7, 21, 9. All of those suggest that there is a special, intimate relationship with God's people and God's son. When we talk about the church, we need to understand that we're talking about messed up people that God has redeemed. And he's still working on them. They're still messed up, but he's still working on them. And they ain't perfect yet, and they ain't going to be perfect till they get to heaven. But God has taken these people from these backgrounds and pulled them together and brought them together around the communion table. We commune together with Christ. In what world? In what world does a Wayne Taggart and a Marion come together? In, in what world does their paths cross on a regular basis? In what world with, would a Ty and Carol Abbott, I was about to say Jeff and Melissa, but y'all are family, so I mean, um, in what world would those backgrounds cross paths with Jerry and Karina? In what world does a postman 
cross paths with somebody. God brings us from all these different backgrounds and brings us together. We are the body of redeemed people, of saved people that come together for a purpose. We have a hard time. In our text tonight, in our text tonight in Ephesians 2, we love Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Without looking, could somebody quote Ephesians 2, 8, and 9? For by grace are you saved. Say it, Carol. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. That's beautiful, ain't it? Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 talks about how God brought us together with him. About how God brought us to God. We were dead in our trespasses and sin. We were made alive by the Spirit. We were saved by grace. He talks about how He brought us together. Kids. salvation I want to play the part of God just to kind of come here Wayne you can be God too I'm not being God okay alright this is God the Father alright so for representation but tonight we're going to let we're going to let Taggart be God the Father in salvation what God does through Jesus, I don't like playing Jesus either, but I ain't fooling nobody else. Through Jesus, he brings you to God. That's what salvation is, right? That makes sense to everybody, right? You stay there. But, but in salvation, Jesus is bringing other people to God, right? All right, come on, kids. All of you, come, come right up here by Brother Wayne. Come on. Now, some of us move slower to God and others move faster. This is a picture of the church. Now they messed up. Lucas is going to be loud. Lena's going to roll her eyes. Rachel's going to catch an attitude. And TJ's going to do something that's going to get him popped in his mouth. They're not perfect. They're not. They're, except for you. You were perfect. <laughs> they're, they're not perfect. But they are together. And the only way, you, you, you two come here, the only way for these two to, to grow some distance is for them to grow some distance from God. The church's purpose is to come together, come on, please, is to come together to worship God. Not, that's God, not Wayne right there. We're not worshiping Wayne. 
We come together to worship God. And any time anything gets in the way of that, we're wrong. Well, preacher, you don't understand what Linda, uh, what, Linda. I'm done picking on you. <laughs> you don't understand what Linda did. She's so mean. She, she says the nastiest things. She, she gives me the nastiest looks. She walks on the other side of the church, and bless God, she won't even shake my hand. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? <laughs> I'm talking. Let me tell you something. One of y'all, if not both of y'all, are wrong. Because as we grow, I, I use this in marriage counseling. Husband and wife, as they grow closer to God, go back to God. They inevitably grow closer to each other. The closer you get to that guy, the closer you got to get to all them other people. And you don't mind them other people. Because you find out that they love the same guy that you love. And he, listen, if God is willing to call somebody son, I don't care what they're like. If God can call them daughter, I can call them sister. Church. This. All right, y'all go sit back down. It's about to get crazy. This is <clears throat> it's what a church is. It's what a church does. And it's what a church looks like. If God will help us, if God will be gracious to us and help us, my prayer is, is that picture of unity and God's grace as we all draw closer to Him and closer to each other, that's my prayer, that God would let it be. I want to be closer to Mike Brown sometimes. I want to be closer to Miss Gloria, except on Sunday mornings when she's listening to Joel Osteen. I want to be closer to the family. You know why? Because if the family draws closer, they're drawing closer to God. What a church is, what a church does, and what a church looks like. It's through the church. It is through the church that God has chosen to manifest his glory to the nations. Let me break that down. I'm done. God chose us, the local, visible body of believers to tell people about his good news. He uses us to tell other people about how good he is and, and beg them to repent. That's what he does. That's the avenue that God has chosen. Now, if that's the case, then I'll say this one more time. Everything we do ought to be about glorifying Him. And if it's not, we ought to rethink it. Preacher, you talking about singing? I'm talking about preaching. I'm talking about teaching. I'm talking about shouting. I'm talking about fellowshipping. I'm talking about everything. Everything. May God help us. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the church. Well, she ain't perfect, but Lord, she's yours. And God, we thank you for it. May you bless us. May you use us. And may you carry us along until we get back. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. And amen.
Remember, Wednesday night, 6 o'clock. God bless you.